With the introduction of corporate average fuel economy or CAFE standards in the 1970s, automakers were really grasping at different solutions to improve fuel economy in their vehicles. Some of the solution was clearly to downsize cars, which happened for the General Motors lineup in 1977 and again in 1985 for the full-size vehicles. But another solution was to come up with, let's call them interesting, engines and transmissions to put in vehicles. One of the solutions, for example, was to start using the Chevette transmission, the Turbohydromatic 200, in full-size vehicles like the Chevrolet Impala behind engines, including the Chevrolet 305. You can imagine what kind of reliability resulted from putting a transmission that was originally engineered to be behind a relatively small four-cylinder engine, and now taking it out of that application and putting it behind a relatively large five-liter V8. It was not successful. Another solution that General Motors came up with was the introduction of the Oldsmobile diesel engine for the 1978 model year. In this 1978 model year, Oldsmobile introduced a 350 cubic inch V8 diesel that was largely based on the 358 cubic inch gasoline engine. It was a decent idea in principle, and Oldsmobile actually did strengthen a number of key elements of its gasoline engine block and internals in order to accommodate it transitioning to a diesel. However, it did have a number of problems. In particular, the number of head bolts and the clamping force on the diesel just wasn't sufficient to keep the head gaskets in place often on these early diesels. And they would blow head gaskets, and they also had some teething issues associated with the injection pumps. Perhaps in part because Oldsmobile diesel engines never received water separators. This was a typical issue at the time that a buyer would get water in their fuel system, and there was no water separator on these vehicles where the owner could purge the water from the overall system. And, of course, there was the whole aspect that U.S. consumers were not all that used to driving diesels in their vehicles, and they didn't necessarily enjoy the clank, clank, clank noise that they emitted, especially diesels during this time period compared to modern diesels, and the requisite black smoke out back that was produced from the exhaust. These 350 cubic inch V8 diesels made just 120 horsepower, 220 pound-feet of torque, in their early years and in later years made 105 horsepower and 205 pound-feet of torque. So you can imagine when they were situated in 4,000 pound full-size vehicles, those vehicles were endowed with a certain slowness that is pretty indescribable by modern standards. Zero to 60 in 18 or 19 seconds was pretty common. In 1979, Oldsmobile introduced a one-year only 4.3 liter V8 diesel this was a very short-lived engine. Like I said, it was just for one year only. And it produced just 90 horsepower and 160 pound-feet of torque. This particular engine only made it under hood in Oldsmobile-based applications as opposed to the 350 that was used across the GM lineup. It even made its way into Cadillacs and, frankly, was the standard engine in the 1980 Bustleback Seville. The 261 cubic inch 4.3 liter V8 diesel just found its way under the hood in the Oldsmobile Cutlass Salon and Supreme, as well as the Cutlass Calais in 1979. In 1982, GM decided that it should proliferate the diesel experience for its buyers and introduced a new 4.3 liter V6 diesel for longitudinal and transverse applications. It made 85 horsepower and 165 pound-feet of torque and was introduced in a number of front-wheel drive vehicles as well as some rear-wheel drive vehicles. On the front-wheel drive side, this V6 diesel made its way into a number of A-body vehicles, the Chevrolet Celebrity, Pontiac 6000, Olds Cutlass Sierra, and Buick Century from 1982 until 1985. But it could also be found under hood in some of the A-body, now renamed G-body rear-wheel drive vehicles, the Chevrolet Malibu and Monte Carlo, the Buick Regal, and the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme and Calais. It would even make its way into the one-year-only full-size front-wheel drive downsize C-body vehicles for General Motors that were introduced in 1985, the Olds 98, the Buick Electra, and the Cadillac DeVille.
And while millions of Oldsmobile diesels were sold, in 1985, GM pulled the entire plug on the program rather abruptly. And after 1985, there were no Oldsmobile V8 or V6 engines any longer. It seems customers had just had enough of the diesel engines, clank, clank, clank noise, the smoke, and some of the catastrophic failures that these engines experienced. But Oldsmobile didn't pull the plug before developing an engine that you've probably never heard of, an experimental V5, and yes, I said that correctly, a V5 diesel that was allegedly suited for applications in GM's front-wheel drive transversely mounted engine and transmission X cars, the Chevrolet Citation, the Pontiac Phoenix, the Buick Skylark, and the Oldsmobile Omega. A V5 engine, much less a diesel, why would any automaker develop something and how would that really work? Well, on the latter front, it's not quite clear to me. My sense is that this engine probably would have a lot of strange internal forces on it that would cause it to vibrate pretty readily. But this was not a time period where, shall we say, refinement was GM's first concern. Witness the Iron Duke 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine, which while reliable, was extremely crude, especially if you had just traded in a vehicle with a silky smooth V8 engine under hood in exchange for something with that Iron Duke under hood. But the idea behind the V5 diesel was that In these X cars, there was not much room to package the transversely mounted engine and transmission. And so if you wanted to fit a V-banked engine in there without totally shoehorning it, why not just have a V5 engine where the dead space for that last cylinder could be used and have it filled with accessories like the alternator or in the case of the diesel, the vacuum pump, because diesels don't have a throttle plate and they need a vacuum pump to power typical vacuum accessories. It was an interesting idea and candidly one that GM had explored as well on the gasoline engine side for the X cars as well before deciding that they would put Chevrolet's 2.8 liter V6 engine under hood that was also first introduced in these X vehicles. And you can see a few pictures here of the prototype Oldsmobile V5 diesel engine that now sits in the Ransomy Oldsmobile Museum in Lansing, Michigan. Notice here this plaque which denotes that this V5 diesel engine displaces 2.5 liters and makes 70 horsepower as well as 111 pound-feet of torque. This was not going to be a powerhouse under hood of the X cars, especially at the time where the Iron Duke engine was not making 100 horsepower but was at least making 90 horsepower and about 135 pound-feet of torque. So the standard four-cylinder engine in the X cars was making both more power and more torque than this diesel. Next, you can see in this photo the one bank of the V5 engine that has the three cylinders. And off to the one side, you can see the vacuum pump as well as the alternator that's sitting kind of above in the valley of the V there. And on the back side of this engine is where there's only two cylinders on that particular bank. And notice that GM has used it to place the injection pump, which here was a Bosch design pump as opposed to the Rusa Master pump used on other Oldsmobile diesel engines. And this pump had to be in this blank area because it couldn't fit in between the 60 degree narrow V. And we'll take one last look at this V5 and notice the cool logo on the intake there. As I mentioned, this is a 60 degree V as opposed to the 90-degree V that was found on the 4.3-liter V6 diesel and, of course, the Oldsmobile V8 diesel. So it was a relatively narrow bank for this particular engine, but a pretty standard bank angle for a V6, and that would have helped it fit under hood in some of these smaller vehicles. Interestingly, this V5 design was not just a brainchild of Oldsmobile, but was also employed by a number of other automotive companies, including VW, who effectively had a V5 that they lopped one cylinder off of their 15-degree angle V6 engine for similar reasons as Olds was pursuing the diesel, mainly packaging. And even Honda had a V5 engine in one of their motorcycles, I believe, in the early 2000s. So strange as it sounds, this engine wasn't all that strange as other automakers introduced V5 engines. One very strange thing about this Olds V5 diesel is that 
it was called experimental, it actually just about made it through to production. A number of individuals contacted me via email and mentioned that they worked for various tooling shops and that their tooling shops had been commissioned to make the tools for this Oldsmobile V5 diesel, but the engine was pulled at the last minute and their companies were actually compensated for the fact that the order was canceled. But it did get pretty far along the line before it was pulled from the eventual General Motors engine lineup. I think at the end of the day, GM realized that this engine just wasn't going to make all that much power and was relatively unrefined and crude, and that the 4.3 liter V6 could actually be shoehorned under hood in the A-body cars. And by this point, CAFE standards had also relaxed a bit, so the need for extreme fuel economy measures was not as great as it was a few years prior when all the automakers thought they were going to have to be 27.5 miles per gallon very quickly. So I believe it's those factors that contributed to Oldsmobile sunsetting the V5 diesel, in addition to just overall cost. Regardless, the engine certainly has its own unique place in history. Hope you enjoyed this special on the Oldsmobile V5 diesel. If you did, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching.